everyone. <coughs> For those of you who don't know me, my name is Stuart Gilmore. Uh, I'm married to my wife, Lindsay. We have three children, one who is now crawling all over the floor. Uh, and I want to thank you so much for giving us the privilege of being able to minister here and to be a part of church for the first time, as we've said, in over six months. It really is a blessing. So thank you for that. And uh, hello to anyone who may be watching on the internet. Uh, I've heard it was on YouTube, so I'm going to assume that there are millions of people watching this this morning. So <clears throat> if you don't mind, I'd just like to say a quick prayer before I begin. Father, we thank you for bringing us here, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share your word. I pray that you would bless the words that I share and the work that I've done. I pray, Lord, that you'd prepare our hearts to hear from you, whether we know you personally or not. We pray that you would uh, help us to hear you and what you have to say to us this morning. So I ask for this blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> One day, this woman was lying on her couch watching TV when she heard her husband in the kitchen and she assumed that he was in there getting some ice cream, and she called in there, bring me some too. A few minutes later, the boyfriend comes into the living room and hands her a bowl. She says, thanks, and takes a bite and immediately spits it out in disgust. What's this? It's disgusting, she exclaimed. Cat food, the husband answered. I was in the kitchen feeding the cat, and I brought you some too. Simple as that. Great joke, eh? Okay? Not my own, not my own. Uh, I'd also like to share some uh, quotes with you this morning. Uh, and when you go looking for quotes from famous people, you don't know whether it's actually them or not. But let's assume that these people, these famous people actually said these. So the first one is, assumptions are made and most assumptions are wrong. Albert Einstein. Assumptions are the termites of relationships. Henry Winkler, you know, the great philosopher that played the fawns in Happy Days. Making assumptions simply means believing things in a certain way with little or no evidence that shows you are correct. And you can see at once how this can lead to terrible trouble. Lemony Snicket, if you know who that is. Uh, famous uh, American president George Washington is quoted as saying, when one side only of a story is heard and often repeated, the human mind becomes impressed with it insensibly and a couple of unknown quotes, you do understand that just because you believe your lies, it doesn't make it the truth. And just because you believe something doesn't make it true. Just because you don't want to believe something doesn't make it false. This message this morning will, I, I, I believe that when you prepare a sermon, actually there's multiple messages for the individuals who hear the message, that, and that often I'm surprised when people say that really spoke into this issue and it wasn't even on your mind that it would help someone in that situation. So I have a lot of faith in God that He will speak to a number of people this morning in different ways, um, but one of the ways we might be looking at is uh, our culture and how we cope with assumptions and accusations. And so what I would start with saying is that perhaps a message this morning for all of us, whether we know Jesus or Christian or, or not, uh, is be careful what you say and assume about someone even for good. Because there is a saying that I'm not going to say, but uh, when you assume things, it makes a fool out of the person that you're assuming things about because you're possibly wrong, probably wrong. Uh, it makes a fool out of you because you're assuming things about a person that you don't know to be true. And the third thing we need to consider is that there is a God that created us and He has very strong views about assumptions and false accusations and beliefs. God is truth. God is concerned with truth. If you want to look for something to pursue in life, truth is right up there at the top. Assumption is not truth. And many a criminal, here's some warnings for this, many a criminal's neighbors have said when interviewed by uh, the media afterwards, they were such a nice person, they were always helping with things in the neighborhood and stuff like that making assumptions about a person that they couldn't possibly do certain things. Many a politician, leader of religion, celebrity, community leader have had the, pull, the rug pulled right up from underneath them because they thought this person would never do something like that. Many uh, people who are ridiculed and accused and, and people have strong views about are, are often surprised 
at the way in which they redeem themselves or we find something out about them that is truly remarkable and we thought, oh, I thought that person was a bad person or so on and so forth. And we live now in a society, which isn't new, by the way, but we do live in a society now which is quite perilous for reputation, freedom of expression, job security, social acceptance, and social protection. Lindsay and I actually have friends in the States who are Christians who are distraught at what is going on in the States. They're seeing friends no longer speaking, family members no longer speaking over political views. And a vote for one person or party can bring a thousand assumptions about your motivation, intention, and character. A stance that you take, especially one that is contrary to the stance of any number of highly vocal movements or activists on any number of issues, including things like gender reform, hate crime, global warming, corporations, capitalism, COVID, or any other number of hot issues that are out there, your stance on that, be very careful because it can leave you ostracized and condemned by a significant number of people with no apologies accepted, no grace. We see celebrities who say, I did something in the 70s, I'm sorry about it. Too late. You're done. No more book signings. No more TV shows. No more interviews. You are condemned for having once had a view that is now considered the most heinous thing you could ever possibly do, and there's no forgiveness. And even more perilous, I think, is that the very dictionary we use to communicate is being changed. Words are being misused, dished out to both the deserving and the undeserving. But with one little caveat, that the person dishing out the word has the freedom and the right to redefine that word to make it fit you. And the word I am most concerned about is the word bigot and any variation of it. They now have millions of bigots, millions of horrible people in the world because we are taking words and assigning them to people we have no business assigning them to. And it happens on both sides of political divides. But then there's the myth as well that there's only two sides. There is no middle anymore. You cannot be in the middle in your culture. You're either 100% this way or 100% that way. If you're in the middle, you might as well be the bad guys because you're not, do you're not standing with us on this issue. And I think that's very concerning. It affects me. I teach in schools, I preach, I have jobs with charity, I have ministry, I have a family, I have children that go to school. And it can make the world seem a lot smaller when the words that you use and the way that you think and the things that you question are under such violent scrutiny, such oppression to even question or think differently from someone else. It makes the world smaller, especially for those who are finding it hard to keep up with the change, finding it hard to know, well, what is acceptable behavior now? It seems that now we're adding more and more things that you can't say or do. What does freedom of expression mean? When do we cross the line into an area that uh, is, is no longer freedom of expression, but violent speech, as people call it? that all of a sudden words are now violence. And of course, the world's a smaller place. I mean, look at us this morning, people online having to be in church online. The world's a smaller place simply because of this epidemic and the, the steps we've been taking to try and curb it and keep it at bay. And I do con be concerned for young people today, especially those who had their exams marked down and up and they, they don't know what's going on. It must be a very frightening time. I cannot think of a time more uncertain uh, that I've experienced in my life since 9-11, where we have red, amber, green, it was right after 9-11. We're really in danger of terrorism. Oh, no, we're not in danger of terrorism. It must be a very unsettling experience for all, but especially for young people growing up. What does the future look like? The world seems a lot smaller. 
the dreams we had when we leave school, I'm going to do this and that, must seem small for a lot of young people. I mean, even hearing that Djokovic, I mean, have you ever seen that Novak Djokovic hit that, uh, that woman in the throat with a, a tennis ball? Watching that, I was just like, this is just another example of how crazy times are. That's just not something I would have expected to see. Maybe not everyone thinks that way, but I just thought this is, we're just, and then we're hearing about Brexit and Trump and Biden. It's just very, very unsettling times. So what are we to do about this as Christians? These are, we're all just here going, oh, I want to come to church and hear a good message, and I believe we will hear a good, encouraging message from God this morning. What are we to do with this stuff? Because someone is right. And all these issues that people are arguing about politically, someone is right. One of the arguments is right. Both sides can't be right. There is a truth. And it either is the truth or it's not the truth. But here's the problem. There may be right on both sides. Good points on this argument and good points on that argument. And I am deliberately not picking on particular issues for the very reasons I've just said. I don't want people knocking at my door. I want to have my job. (laughs) That's scary. But there is truth in there somewhere, and we must be able to pursue it. So what as Christians should we do? Well, some would say, don't get involved in politics. Just give to Caesar what is Caesar's, pray for the people in power, and don't get involved. But others would say, it's not politics, it's morality. And then some would say, but we're not meant to judge the world. And then others would say, it's not judgment, It's standing up for what is true and protecting people like women and children and their rights. And some would say, yes, but God's kingdom is not of this world. You know, Jesus said that if he wanted to, you know, he could have had a big army of people to force uh, Christianity on people. And others would say, well, that's a cop-out because we have to stand up and be counted for speaking the truth. So it's clear that even in the church, we need to have conversations. How do we respond to the things that are being discussed? I mean, uh, thankfully, we have organizations like Evangelical Alliance and CARE and various other things who help to speak and hopefully represent certain views of, of Christians. But here's the other problem. There is a lot to be said from Scripture about the various issues that we're concerned about today. A lot to be said about COVID and how we respond and what the future likes. God has lots of things to say about everything in life. And here's the thing, I actually don't believe that God has asked me to tell you what He thinks about any number of issues this morning. Uh, Not this morning, anyway. I mean, there are things to be said, but I don't think it's for this morning. We should be celebrating, in some ways, the fact that we're back together. Not getting bogged down in the things that you're trying to escape when you come to church. Not being reminded of it. And that's the difficulty is that there are things going on in the world that are so concerning, we actually, our heart breaks, but then we have people, Lindsay and I, uh, our brother-in-law and sister-in-law, have a friend who's 38 with terminal cancer and is probably thinking about how he may only have one year left with his wife and five-year-old child. That's devastating. Similar age to me. There are others waiting on scan results. There are others who are concerned about their alcoholic child or husband or father or wife. There are others in constant pain struggling with depression or other mental health issues. Basically, there are people in here, online, in the world, dealing with real pain right now in their own home. And the thought of how do we theologically and academically and socially engage with these big issues just is the last thing on their mind. So, I believe the scripture that that God gave me for this morning actually speaks into what I've began to talk about, but also into the pain and the suffering that we experience in the here and now. I believe it will address these issues, but I think it will also give us all a vision, an encouragement, yes, a challenge, but also a reassurance, which I think we all need just now, because life is difficult. It's always difficult but it's especially difficult just now. And it will also, I hope, let those who are curious about Christ, if there is anyone who's curious about Christ, see the vision that God has given us for what it is to be a Christian, to live in this life, and to live with other Christians. 
So Peter writes, and he writes, that finally all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. What are we to be like? Sympathetic, loving, compassionate, and humble. That's what we all have to be like-minded about. There's other words we can throw in there, but, you know, what should a church's vision or key values be? Well, there's a good one right there. We are sympathetic. We love one another. We are compassionate and we're humble. Not a bad thing to build a church on or a community on. How does that look? It looks totally the opposite from what we see on the media in politics. That's what young people need. That's what everyone needs. The opposite of what we are seeing. I go into school and I speak to kids about how they should be kind to each other and relationships and how it's important. And then they're maybe watching, having their dinner and and their parents are watching Parliament. And the very governments who are asking us to go in and teach kids how to be kind and nice to each other are slandering each other and calling each other names. Um, Kids need, young people need an example of a community that actually works. And we're not finding it in movements. We're not finding it in politics. We're finding division and uncertainty. So Peter reveals to us the kind of church, the kind of people we're meant to be. No more eye for an eye stuff. I believe it was uh, Gandhi who'd said that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind, or it was uh, a Dalai Lama. I'm not sure who said that, but what a great, uh, great quote. But we've forgotten that quote. Used to see that all the time. Now it's, no, no, uh, take out people's eyes that disagree with you. We we must rid the world of, of differences of opinion. No more being evil back to one another. Because the desire is when someone really is evil, to us, that we want to be evil back. Peter says, no. God says, no. Do not repay evil with evil. Instead, bless those who are evil to you. Jesus said himself, bless those who persecute you. Why? For yourself. Not for them. For yourself. Growing up, I always thought being a Christian meant that you just let people do whatever they want and you don't say boo to a goose There's reward for doing good. There is reward for charity. There is reward for being like Christ. And there should be no shame in doing things for blessing. Because at the end of the day, if you're not repaying evil with evil, you are doing good for other people, but you are receiving the blessing of God. And he goes on to say, whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Do good. Again, the opposite of what I'm seeing in culture, the opposite. Christ is telling us to not be violent and aggressive and name-calling and slander and cancel people and never forgive them. He's telling us to do the opposite. Love people, forgive them, be kind, be merciful, be humble, have a heart for them. That's what we need to show young people. It's what we need to show each other, especially at this time, because it is an uncertain time, as they keep saying, unprecedented times. We need church to be together as best we can, loving one another, showing each other that there is more to what we're seeing on the news. Does this guarantee good days? This is another issue we have. It says, it says do this, and if you want to see good days, then this is what you should do. I think time and again that people uh, misread and misunderstand and think, well, that means if you do this, then you'll be rich, or if you do this, then you'll have no problems. But that's just not the message of Christ at all. Let's see what Peter goes on to say. You know, he says, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Well, lots of people. (laughs) I mean, Peter's not saying you won't experience harm. 
But he's saying, look, well, who are you more concerned about? God or people? Because good is no longer considered good in our society by very influential movements and people. So you will be doing good as Christians in the years to come, but it will be seen as evil. It has been prophesied that this will happen, and we're right here now, that what is good is now considered evil, and what is evil is considered good. So I can guarantee you, in the future, that we will face suffering and accusation for doing good. But here is the encouragement. Even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he made on made proclamation into the imprisoned spirits to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. There's some interesting theological, historical things in there that were not really addressed this morning. But the key here is that no matter what we are facing, it is better to suffer for doing good than doing evil. Now, that should be a check for us as Christians. Because I, have, I remember being at the Manchester Passion many years ago. Uh, and there were some Christians, it was a big march, and it was like Tim Booth from the band James and the Stone Roses were all part of this big passion play in the city of Manchester. And I was right there amongst a big crowd that were meant to be carrying the cross all the way along to the main square in Manchester. Uh, and so there were lots of Christians represented there, and me and some friends were there. And there were some people who were not Christian, who were dressed like Satan and devils and witches. And they were there for part of the, the frolicking. And what my friend and I witnessed from Christians was awful. People were coming out and going right up to their faces and screaming in their faces and screaming Scripture at them. And they were afraid. They'd came along for fun. They thought this would be a laugh. Even if they were just having a wee joke at the Christian's expense, some of the Christians present gave a horrible, horrible witness. Horrible witness. And I thank the Lord that my friend and I were there and we could speak to them because we could relate to them. It turned out we had similar interests in music and art and things like that, and we were able to hopefully keep it be what would have been a terrible witness of what Christ has asked us to do, which is to not repay evil for evil, not to slander those who slander us, not to make fun of those who make fun of us. That is what church should be. That is what the light should be. We're not perfect. We'll get it wrong. We'll have to be humble. We'll have to say we're sorry. But that's better than living in the world with no grace, no mercy, no understanding, no room for mistakes, in which we are seeing very clearly when it comes to political, social, moral issues in our society today. And in, he closes, well, it doesn't close, but the last couple of script verses is that Peter says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. That's one of our calls, one, the call, 
is to live like Christ. And think about what Christ achieved through his suffering. You know, Lindsay and I have a, a, a pastor. He's a friend and pastor and his, his wife. They pastor us online from the States. Uh, and Lindsay's on, went through a lot of suffering with PTSD and mental health issues and, and physical health issues over the last few years, which have been excruciating at times and some really hard days that, that come along, sometimes hard weeks in which we're really up against it. And our, our pastor, Mike, who's actually visited here with us before, uh, if you may, may remember him, Mike and Mary from Denver, um, he's always said uh, that you are sharing in the suffering of Christ. Uh, and that, that means we're also sharing in the joy and the glory of Christ also, that we, that we are closest, almost closest to Christ when we are suffering uh, for serving Him and that has a huge, been a huge encouragement to me over the years is that when we're suffering, we're not further from God. In fact, we're actually closer. We're experiencing what Christ experienced on the cross, all the more so when we're suffering because we're speaking His truth, all the more because we are loving the way He has asked us to do. That's the kind of suffering I want. I don't shy from that suffering. And I encourage you not to shy from it. Don't be afraid of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, speaking the truth into issues, and loving each other here in this church, and forgiving each other for past sins and waiting for that opportunity for healing. So be like-minded. Love each other. Be an example to each other. Build each other up. And let that example build those who you know who do not know Christ, build them up. I believe that that is God's message for us this morning. Uh, and I do pray a blessing on all of you at this difficult time with COVID um, and encourage you not to stay silent when you're suffering, but to tell your brothers and sisters here at ARG Baptist Church. So thank you for the, the privilege and honor to be here and to share God's word with you this morning. We're going to close with the song, uh, You Chose the Cross. I'll pray, and then we'll, we'll have our kind of closing comments. Thank you.
Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to keep in mind and heart what you were saying to us as individuals this morning. We ask that you would help uh, Ergy Baptist, this community, to keep what you were saying to them this morning and that you would help us to disregard the rest. We pray, Father, for your comfort and your strength to continue in the face of our adversity and trials. And we thank you for the great peace and joy that you offer us. And as Paul said to the church in Rome, now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.